Well, uh, as Ralph said, as uh, Ralph said, uh, we're meeting for several different reasons, and I want to begin by reiterating something that he uh, said right up front, and that is maybe most important is we just want to say thank you for uh, being on the call and really for continuing to support uh, the activities, the, the work of good news. Uh, this has been going on for so long, our struggle for a faithful uh, Methodist church that many have given up along the way, you haven't. Uh, many have let us know that they've left and gone to other denominations, but you've remained. And uh, you're on this call because you have continued to give generously, sacrificially, because you believe in the gospel and because you have a desire for a faithful Wesleyan witness to the world. And, and we're going to get there. Uh, Tom and Ralph and I were certain that that day is coming. And we'll talk about timing later, but we're going to get there. And the reason that this new uh, faithful witness and faithful expression of Wesleyanism is going to come into being is because of God's grace and because of the work of groups like Good News, and you have made that work possible. So Tom and I and Ralph, all of our staff, we are genuinely grateful for you, for your faithfulness, for your generosity, for your love of the church, for your love of Christ, and for your trust uh, in us. So I want to begin talking about uh, the protocol. Um, tell you where that stands. This is the agreement that is going to lead to some kind of uh, final uh, separation. And uh, just a, a brief reminder that uh, coming up with this plan was nothing short of miraculous. There were many, many meetings that Tom and I sat in. We saw little or no progress. At times it felt like uh, people who were on the other side of things weren't really interested in a serious discussion of finding a negotiated way forward. Uh, but a bishop uh, from Africa, from Sierra Leone, by the name of uh, Bishop Yambasu, uh, put a group together. Um, and with the help of a world-class mediator, Kenneth Feinberg, uh, that group was able to create an agreement that made no one completely happy, but that all the parties were able to support. Um, it was announced in January of 2020. It was expected to be voted on at general conference of that year. Its official title is the Protocol of Reconciliation and Grace Through Separation. And practically every organized caucus within the church uh, very quickly came out in favor of this protocol, this plan for separation. Progressive groups did, centrist groups did, and traditional groups like Good News, Confessing Movement, UM Action, Western Covenant Association, others all came out in support of it. Uh, as of now, all of these groups are still on record of supporting the protocol. We are starting to hear some rumblings that perhaps we need to revisit the protocol before voting on it. This is coming from some centrist and progressive bishops and leaders who I think have finally come to understand just how many churches will leave if given the option and go to the new denomination. And I think they're starting to come to grips with the deep financial trouble that the United Methodist Church is in and that the situation will become even more dire once we traditionalists leave. So there's some talk, maybe we need to revisit the protocol, maybe we need to rethink the $25 million that the new denomination is to receive upon departure that maybe should be uh, renegotiated. Um, but I, I'll come back to this. I'm gonna ask Tom to talk about the finances of the UMC at, at present. But I'm gonna come back and say that in spite of all of that, before every general conference, there's always rumbling, always talk of what bishops have said or this leader has said. And we've just learned over the years, all of that matters little. All that matters are those roughly 860 some odd delegates who gather together and who have a vote. And we'll come back and tell you why we believe that vote will be successful in passing the protocol. But Tom, why don't you uh, explain a little bit more about where the United Methodist Church is with its finances and why that is causing some to kind of rethink maybe changing up the protocol just a bit. Sure, thanks Rob. Yeah, the uh, United Methodist Church, along with a lot of churches, experienced a financial downturn in 2020 uh, due to the pandemic. 
Uh, the collection rate on apportionments was uh, nationally was 79%, which is the lowest collection rate in uh, over 15 years. And um, the General Council on Finance and Administration proposed a 31% reduction to the quadrennial budget uh, going into the 2020 General Conference. Um, cutting the budget by one third is not a sign of financial strength. Um, so many of the agencies that are operating in the church have cut their staffs. Um, some uh, are basing their planning on a 50% budget. In other words, what they had last quadrennium, they're cutting it in half and operating on that. The reductions in staff at agencies has ranged from 18% to 40%. The Board of Global Ministries uh, has cut 68 positions from their staff. So there's some, some drastic uh, cutting going on at the national level. Uh, the publishing house, which is self-supporting and not supported by apportionments, also experienced a great uh, downturn due to uh, people not buying resources. There was no Sunday school, there was no vacation Bible school, things like that. And so um, they have cut their staff by 47%. And um, they have decided to work only uh, remotely. So they are, uh, have put their building up for sale. In fact, I think the news just came that it, that sale has been finalized. And um, so that is a dramatic uh, reduction for the publishing house. The Board of Higher Education and Ministry has sold their office building uh, the Board of Global Ministries is working on selling its office building. So there are lots of uh, cuts going on at the national level. Um, there's also uh, the Boy Scout situation. Um, as you know, the Boy Scouts have declared bankruptcy because of the uh, extensive abuse situation uh, over the years. And um, the liability for that not only falls on the Boy Scouts, but it falls on sponsoring organizations. And so that affects local United Methodist churches. There are negotiations going on right now to try to resolve that. But the, uh, the Mormon uh, church, Latter-day Saints, which is the largest um, sponsor of Boy Scout troops, paid $250 million to get themselves out of any liability. So you, we are the second largest sponsor and so that tells you the kind of financial um, liability that we might be facing regarding uh, the Boy Scouts and where that money is going to come from. So the, the whole key here is the uncertainty in what the situation is and the, the decline in general apportionments over the next few years. Obviously, if there's separation, there's going to be another great uh, decline. So. Um, with all this uncertainty, that's what's promoting this idea that maybe we need to reconsider the 25 million. That's part of the protocol. Rob? Thanks, Tom. So as Tom says, you can see why some might be concerned about finances and either have the reaction of maybe we need to try to hold this thing together more or we need to let the traditionalists go but not uh, give them the 25 mil. Um, Here's the thing, whatever little tweaks may be made, and again, we're not seeing any kind of groundswell for uh, not supporting the protocol or for renegotiating uh, the $25 million. That's just little rumblings that I thought you should know about. But we do, do feel confident that once the protocol is put before general conference that it will pass. Um, in, in the past, when we've gone to general conference and we have wanted to keep our book of discipline uh, founded on what the Bible teaches, uh, we knew that the centrist and the progressives were all going to vote in a different way. And we knew that we had a very slim majority. We always have. It's gotten slimmer in uh, more recent years. But we knew that we had the votes to keep the discipline uh, biblical, but we had to have all of our votes. Um, we had to have all of our traditional U.S. delegates there. We had to have all of our African delegates there. That's why good news would not only make certain that those delegates got their visas and got here, but that we would 
uh, pay for uh, alternate delegates to come over and to be put up. And some of the monies that you gave made that possible because we knew we needed every one of those votes and, and uh, we needed all of the traditionalists in the Philippines and in e Eastern Europe. Everybody had to be there so we could eke out a victory that sometimes were a matter of uh, 60 votes uh, thereabouts. And I, I can tell you, Tom may have done this too, but I, I can tell you, I have rushed out into the hall as a vote was coming. And um, the, our, our African brothers and sisters have a different sense of time than we do. And sometimes those who want to change the discipline have uh, arranged votes on critical issues right after meals. where They know the Africans are less likely to be in their seats right on time. I've rushed out and started waving my hand, yelling, vote, vote, time for vote. And many of them speak French and have no clue what this crazy guy is doing, waving his arms. But it was always, it's always been very uh, nerve wracking and uh, really kind of draining when those votes came because we knew they'd be so close. But what we are convinced of is that uh, practically all of our traditional U.S. delegates will vote for the protocol. We also believe that uh, most of the Africans will. And, and that would get us close to the 50% that we need. But the good news is we believe that most centrists want this and most progressives want this. Many of them are just as tired as we are of uh, fighting. And many of them know that it's time to um, put an end to this dysfunction that we're that we are uh, have been embroiled in for uh, nearly the past 50 years. So we don't need many of those votes to get over the 50% mark, uh, though we think we will get the majority of those as well. So th the point there is that once we do have a vote, we feel very confident that the protocol will pass. But to have a vote, we have to have a general conference and uh, we have one scheduled. Um, in August and early September of 2022. And Tom's gonna to talk with us a little bit as to uh, the likelihood of general conference actually being held. So the general conference, uh, as Rob mentioned, is scheduled for the last week of August uh, next year. And uh, there are rumblings about maybe we should postpone again. And um, the, what, what I've uh, found in talking to the members of the Commission on a General Conference who makes that decision is that they are uh, at this point dedicated to having General Conference next year. Um, there's been no talk in that commission about postponement, et cetera. They are scheduled to meet either in uh, February or March of next year to make any kind of decision that needs to be made regarding uh, postponement. So we don't expect to know that until um, that point next spring. But there are really two primary issues that would cause potential for postponement. One is uh, the vaccination of overseas delegates. As you know, the US has uh, stipulated that others coming from overseas, people coming from outside the country, need to be vaccinated in order to get admission. So we're telling uh, delegates overseas, they need to get vaccinated. Um, that the vaccine is their second passport. Uh, and there's been a good response to that uh, knowledge. Uh, but of course, in Africa, the spreading of the vaccine is uh, very shaky and uh, slow. Um, there are some countries that are progressing on that regard and other countries have not received any vaccine. So um, the question is, will the African delegates be able to be vaccinated? And um, the good news is that that um, I was in Africa a couple of weeks ago uh, for a meeting in Nairobi with Africa initiative leaders from a number of different countries. And they all reported that, that it is possible to get a vaccine. And uh, in fact, over half of that group has already been fully vaccinated. And we found that there are a number of delegations already that are fully vaccinated. So uh, we are, uh, in partnership with our friends in Africa, working to get all the delegates vaccinated and make sure that that information can be shared with the commission so that they know who's been vaccinated and 
what the likelihood is of delegates getting that vaccine. So we, we are cautiously optimistic that the vaccination is not going to be a problem. Uh, in, in a lot of the countries of Africa, they have not set up a protocol for how people are vaccinated. Uh, it's just a first come, first serve. And so that should allow our delegates to get uh, their vaccines. The other issue that we face is the same issue we face all the time, which is visas. Um, and the uh, process for getting a visa, especially for the people in the Democratic Republic of Congo is very, very difficult. I mean, they have to travel several days to get to a place where they can um, get a visa. They have to stay several days at a hotel. Um, it's a very difficult process for them. And so oftentimes there are a number of delegates that don't make it because they don't get a visa. I think in uh, St. Louis, we, they, they told us there were 30 delegates that, from Africa that did not receive visas who were not there. Um, but of course, with the pandemic, a lot of the embassies have been closed. The State Department has demonstrated um, uh, problems with short staffing, uh, handling refugees, uh, the Afghanistan situation, that's all the State Department. And so um, there is concern about whether people will be able to get back, uh, visas. Um, the staff of the Commission is working with uh, people to try to, to um, move that process along. And we also have informal contacts with government officials and uh, senators and Congress people that we are working with to try and uh, make sure that those visas can happen. Um, so we, if those two issues can be addressed, um, we sh there should be no other reason why we should not be able to meet as a general conference. But in case uh, there is a problem uh, in, in having a, a general conference in person, uh, it's been talked about the possibility of having a virtual one. Uh, many annual conferences in the US have done that. Um, overseas, there's a problem with the lack of inadequate uh, internet availability, inadequate power, uh, not having computers, the technology not being there. And there's also the issue of security uh, with the delegates. Um, as you know, in St. Louis, there were several delegates who were on the floor of general conference with uh, somebody else's credentials um, and were not supposed to be there. And so there's a real concern about making sure that the delegates are the right delegates. Um, so a totally virtual general conference is probably not um, gonna be able to be happening. The other option would be a distributed general conference where groups of delegates could gather in particular regions, like all the African delegates could gather in Africa, all the US delegates maybe in, um, in uh, Minneapolis. And, and so uh, by meeting in these different places, you could meet at an international hotel that has the internet possibilities and, and be able to participate that way. Um, it's, we still would face the issue of time zone difference. Um, Europe and Africa are between five and eight hours ahead of us, and the Philippines is 13 hours ahead of us. So um, about the only possible time for a plenary session would be 6 a.m. Uh, U.S. Central Time to 10, maybe 6 to 10 a.m., and so, you know, it would be a challenge to negotiate that uh, difference of time. Uh, at, importantly, right now, there's no uh, appetite for that kind of a general conference. Um, neither is there among the Africans, nor is there among the, um, the Commission on a General Conference or any of the church leaders. So I think everybody's putting their eggs in the basket of let's get an in-person uh, general conference meeting. And, um, and we're doing everything we can to have that. Um, I am more optimistic about being able to have an in-person conference after my trip to Africa. We were able, the five of us from the US went over. We were able to negotiate all of the uh, travel protocols. Uh, my ears got sore from wearing a mask for 24 hours straight, but um, that was doable, and uh, we all got tested. Um, all the, nobody got sick while we were there. We had about 20, 22 people uh, meetings, and um, everything went really well. 
So, um, we think that it's possible to have a general conference in person and we're, and we're working for it. Do you want me to go on and, and address what we covered at the Africa meeting, Rob? You're muted. I said, uh, let's come back uh, to that, Tom, and we'll, okay. we'll catch up on that. But that's uh, very good. And if you're not muted, go ahead and do that. I think I heard a little background noise. I will uh, kind of build on something that Tom said. We talked about visas and how hard it is sometimes for people to get visas. Um, and Tom will remember the details better than I did. But one year, uh, there was a group, I believe it was 10 or 12 folks who had traveled to get their visas and had traveled many days to get there. And then they were delayed. And so their one option was to go all the way back several days and then come back several days. Or they contacted Good News and said, can y'all just put us up for a week? And you just put us in a hotel room and pay for our meals because that would really be helpful. And we were more than happy to do that. But the only reason we can do that is because you people give uh, generously and we have the funds to do that. So uh, there's so much that goes on behind the scenes that uh, you might not know, but your generosity makes possible. Another kind of interesting moment was uh, there were a couple and man, it is such a great effort. We have so many great people because we do a very good job of greeting our African brothers and sisters and getting connected with them. We meet them at the airport and uh, we have a special training session away from general conference a few days beforehand. So we have to get them all in buses and get them out to a campground and all that. Well, there are a couple of African women that we just couldn't find at the airport. And we've got some great people there. They've learned how to hunt folks down and find them. And uh, finally, after a couple of days, we got, we were contacted and they said, well, where are you? And we said, well, we've been at the, uh, at the airport looking for you. This was in Portland, Oregon. Where are y'all? Well, we're in Portland. Well, a discussion discovered that they had booked their flights for Portland, Maine, not for Portland, Oregon. And so again, here's, uh, additional uh, cost to get them over here, which we're very happy to do. That's that's one of the things th that we do to make certain that general conference goes well. But Tom's thoughts just made me think of that. And um, it, it just, I wanted to let you know some of the different ways that you, you guys have been behind the scenes making things work that you might never know about. So uh, we are, seeing some interesting developments with our centrist and progressive bishops. Uh, as they see what's happening, uh, they're having two very different reactions. Uh, there is one group, and we need to give credit where credit is due. There's one group who, uh, they did not share our views regarding sexuality or maybe even you know, the uh, authority and inspiration of the Bible. But they realize that churches are in limbo and that this is very difficult, and that congregations are being hurt. And so they are talking uh, behind the scenes about finding a way to let traditional churches leave under terms similar to the protocol, even if general conference is put off or uh, delayed. Um, nothing official has happened yet but uh, many of these uh, centrist and progressive bishops are good faith partners and uh, they are talking about how we can find a way for that to happen. Now, I wouldn't say that's the majority uh, of the bishops, but there's some that are doing that. On the other hand, and if you've been reading what uh, Tom or I have written or what's come out of the uh, WCA, you know that some of our centrist and progressive bishops have started playing hardball uh, in, in New Jersey and Southern California and in uh, North Georgia. Uh, bishops, uh, without following the process that is required by our book of discipline for moving a pastor and appointing a new pastor to a congregation, there's supposed to be a process of consultation both with the pastor and then with the congregation. You ask the congregation what kind of 
Pastor, what skills, what gifts are particularly important to you at this time? It makes good sense to talk about theology so that you point someone who's a good match. Uh, but these three bishops uh, summarily announced the removal of leading pastors in each of those annual conferences without any consultation of the pastor or uh, the churches. And this has um, got incredibly um, belligerent, I would say. I, I, in Southern California, it was three Korean churches and the bishop there felt like they were being disloyal simply because they were telling people that the protocol was a possibility, that it was going to be voted on at general conferences and churches would have to decide what they were going to do. Just uh, alerting people to what's going on in the church was enough for that bishop to feel as if his authority had not been uh, respected. And so he announced the uh, removal of three Korean pastors. And uh, when you can get Koreans to protest uh, authority, you've really done something. And this bishop really did something because these uh, very faithful uh, Korean congregations, many of them picketed uh, where the bishop was speaking and they really rose up. And uh, we have done all we can to support those congregations, the congregation and the pastor in New Jersey and the church in uh, Marietta, just outside of Atlanta. Many of you will know that story of Mount Bethel Church, one of our leading churches, a, a great, great church. Tom and I have been there. I've preached there. We know the people there. We know their heart for Christ, for missions, for their community. And uh, the bishop there just so mishandled it, and it's brought such uh, pain uh, to their congregation. Um, that church has, uh, is trying to uh, disaffiliate, and she's making it uh, difficult for them to be able to do that. But we were able to help in such a way, and other traditional uh, groups like uh, Confessing Movement and WCA and others uh, did too. And it seems like what these bishops were going to start doing, uh, that tide has been uh, stemmed. Um, but we, we want you to know that um, things are, are very unpleasant for many of our brothers and sisters. And there have been places in the past where you had very liberal bishops uh, in the West, for example, or some in um, the Northeast and even some in the Midwest where you have very liberal bishops, very liberal uh, annual conferences and traditionalists have uh, been mistreated and they have uh, really been demeaned in many different ways. But when this is starting to happen in North Georgia, it tells you that we are in a different phase and we need to do everything we possibly can to bring about um, the, the protocol and a, a means of separation uh, for people. So that I think in a sense is where we are. Uh, Tom is gonna visit with you a little bit about where he discovered folks in Africa are because they make up such a huge proportion of our uh, annual uh, general conference delegates. And then he's going to uh, talk with you about the future denomination and why he and I are so excited about the future that we're going to be able to step into. Thanks, Rob. As you know, the Africans make up about uh, 32 or 33 percent of the delegates. They actually make up over 40 percent of the members of the United Methodist Church. Uh, they're a bit underrepresented at General Conference. And um, so for the last seven years or so, we've been working in close partnership with uh, leaders in Africa to coordinate strategy and to coordinate our ability to work together for a common goal, which is to uh, maintain the faithfulness of the church. Um, as I mentioned, we were in Nairobi a couple weeks ago, uh, and we had representatives from 10 of the 13 Episcopal areas uh, in Africa there. And so we had a very good cross-section of leaders, and they um, uh, we were able to share information with them about the protocol, about the process, about what's going on in the U.S., uh, talk about what their future looks like, um, what might happen there. Um, they were very appreciative of the information. Um, 
some of them were, this was their first time attending such a meeting. And I remember one district superintendent from uh, South Congo who was studiously taking notes on everything that we said, because he said, I wanna go back and share this with our, our people, our pastors. And so um, that was the purpose of the meeting really was to give them the information that they could then in turn disseminate to the, the pastors in their annual conferences. We talked about uh, some of the provisions of the uh, proposed global Methodist church, what the discipline might look like and, and um, heard some concerns that they had about uh, different areas. And, and um, this is something that we're gonna continue to dialogue about because we are gonna be a global church. And if, if things happen the way we think they will happen, the Africans will be a majority at general conference. And so uh, we talked about how we might navigate that situation. Um, the Africans continue to plan and strategize about how to become more self-supporting. Uh, they realize right now they're pretty dependent upon Western money and um, they wanna be able to generate the resources that they need to further the work of the church so that they become less dependent. And we certainly wanted to affirm that. Um, we, we can continue to coordinate with the Africans. Um, we, we will be meeting next May with uh, representatives from all of the annual conferences. We'll have uh, probably two to three uh, general conference delegates from every annual conference there. So we'll be uh, meeting with over 60 people and uh, preparing the way for a general conference. And then next August, right before general conference, we invite all of the African delegates, as well as uh, Eastern Europeans, as well as the Philippines to join us for a like three day meeting prior to general conference where we go over what's gonna happen at general conference. And we talk about how you um, uh, negotiate the process of Robert's rules of order, which is very foreign to them and all of that kind of thing. So we really work extensively to prepare them to be an effective part and an equal partner in what happens at General Conference. So that's been a, a fruitful uh, partnership over the years, and, and I'm excited about the continuation of that. And there's a real uh, desire on their part to be a full and equal partner in the new Global Methodist Church and to uh, be able to contribute what they can contribute, which is uh, spiritual fervor and uh, uh, enthusiasm and lots of uh, strategies that they use to grow the church that perhaps we could benefit from as well. And so that leads me to the excitement that we have about what's coming next. Um, as Rob said, we don't know exactly when, we hope next fall, uh, but we believe that a new day is coming and a new, a new church will be formed that is going to be faithful to scripture and uh, united around our common doctrinal heritage. Um, the delay of General Conference was a, actually a godsend because it provided the opportunity for the Global Methodist Church to put together its structure and its leadership. Uh, we were able to develop a, a potential uh, book of discipline, doctrines and discipline that we can operate by. And um, in addition to that, more than a dozen Tax forces have been involved planning various areas of ministry from uh, youth ministry, young adult ministry, church planting and evangelism, missions, uh, ministry with uh, marginalized people. Um, all these different areas have been uh, worked on by task forces that pulled in hundreds of people, literally hundreds of people have been involved uh, both from the U.S. as well as from uh, Africa and Europe and the Philippines as well. So um, it's, it's given opportunities for us to begin working together at a global level to plan ministry and to plan how the new church will actually function. And some of these task forces have become ongoing uh, groups, uh, transitional commissions, we're calling them, that will help implement the plans that they've drawn up. Um, and so, so if you've been following the, the uh, articles from the WCA, you know that um, these, these various groups have developed fairly extensive plans for ministry that really uh, hold great promise for being able to uh, make the new church effective in ways that the current United Methodist Church has not been. 
So we're excited about the potential that exists here. And uh, we look across the country and uh, in the words of Jesus, the, the harvest is white. Uh, and we need to pray for workers to go into the harvest and harvest what God has laid out for us. And that's really what the Global Methodist Church is preparing to do. Um, we are ready to go. Um, we've worked on most of the nuts and bolts. Uh, there's a pension plan in, in place and uh, other kinds of mundane details are being put together. So uh, this is something that we are really um, excited about, the potential that exists and the way that, that God is putting all the pieces together. Thanks, Tom. Um, let, I'll say a little something about that, and then I'll uh, wind up. And if there are any questions, if you want to put them in the uh, chat feature, then we will be uh, very happy uh, to respond uh, to that. Uh, the fact that so much good work has been done in this new, we're calling it the Book of Doctrines and Discipline, is really phenomenal. Um, getting preachers to agree on anything of substance, preachers always have a better idea than the the next person. They, we make our living talking and coming up with ideas and explaining things. And Tom and I worked on uh, a letter uh, in support of the Mount Bethel Church. And then we sent it out to others that we hoped would sign on. And these are our good friends and uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. We work together all the time. And every one of them had a way, a suggestion for how that letter could have been better. Uh, leave this part out, add this, change this phrase. And I told Tom, I said, I think I realized why Jesus chose fishermen to be his disciples rather than preachers. Because fishermen will exaggerate, they'll, tell, they'll even lie. But they won't come up to you at the end of the Sermon on the Mount and say, you know, it really would have been better if you had said it this way. And I can promise you, the preachers, if he'd made them his disciples, would have done that. So when you are the wolves at the door, and when you feel like you've got to fight to keep the discipline right, we can all get together and agree. We're very unified. When it comes to start creating a new vision for a church, uh, that's when everybody has their particular concern. If you've had a good bishop, then you're happy to have bishops in the future. If you've had a bad bishop, you don't want any bishops at all. And the fact that really, really bright minds. I mean, I, the best folks that we have came together and put this book together. Uh, it is really exciting uh, because it is about ministry. It's about how we're effectively going to share the gospel, uh, how the church is going to be organized uh, to do that, um, and, and much more authority is going to be given to local uh, churches. Um, I, I've used this analogy. Some people say, well, I don't like bishops. Y'all are just setting up the very same thing that got us into trouble in the first place. And I can appreciate that concern. But what I tell them is back in the 1930s, a, a group of uh, actors created a studio called United Artists. And they wanted a studio that were, was about the artist. Uh, they, they didn't want the executives to have the vision and they didn't want things to go best for the shareholders necessarily they they wanted we're the artists we're the ones that are casting a, a creative vision we want something that's really supportive of, of what we want to achieve and that's how i see what the global methodist church is those of us who are in ministry uh, these are not bishops giving us ideas. These are not uh, bureaucrats from our boards and agencies. These are people just like uh, you. These are local church lay persons. These are pastors who want to do effective ministry. They know how an annual conference and a general conference can be supportive. They know how general and annual conferences can get in the way. And so they, we are creating something that really gives great authority and creativity uh, that will promote entrepreneurship within the local church. So uh, as Tom says, we are extremely excited about where we're going. We're frustrated that it's taken so long. We're grateful that people like you have heard us say, hey, don't leave, hang in there. We're going to get there one day. And if we, you have let Lucy pull the football out uh, in front of you, over and over again, Lucy being the bishops uh, primarily and, and others, 
but you've hung in there and we really are gonna get there and we're very excited about that. Let me finish up with this. And then if there are any questions, uh, I saw one come, maybe more. Um, let me tell you why we believe that what we're doing is so important. And it's really because this is uh, about the faith that has been entrusted to the saints once and for all. Uh, what we're trying to do is not to get our way. It's not to control other people. Uh, it has nothing to do with money. All these charges have been made in the past that this is what we're about. And those are really uh, things that are said by people who don't know us, don't know you, uh, don't know our heart, don't know that uh, really we care little about getting our way, but that we are committed to God's grace and truth given to us in Jesus uh, and our Wesleyan heritage that we think is so special and explaining what God has done, that that be uh, not only preserved, but that it be promoted. And this is not a, a new battle. I've been spending some time in the book of Jude, and I believe that you're not going to find any book in the New Testament more relevant to where the United Methodist Church is uh, right now than that little book of Jude. Just it, It'll take you three or four minutes to read it. I suggest you do that uh, today. And there were a number of issues that Jude was having to deal with. He tells the uh, people of the church that he was writing, I wanted to write to you about our shared faith in Christ. I wanted to delve in and go deep, but something's going on that I've got to address. And in some ways, that's where we Methodists have been. We should have all these years been focused completely on sharing the gospel with people, the salvation that is ours in Jesus Christ, and how do we promote that and bring it into the lives of others, and help believers understand it more deeply. But we've had this battle regarding sexuality and sexual ethics, and, and that's exactly what Jude is facing. Uh, he talks that they are promoting immorality, uses that terminology. And, and so he's dealing with, a, with false teachers who are promoting sexual immorality within the church. Uh, and he says, and it's very interesting how there's really nothing new under the sun. The Bible tells us that. He says they are promoting this on the basis of their own personal views and beliefs. He calls these false teachers who are promoting false doctrines. He calls them dreamers, these dreamers. These are people who are driven by their own ideas, their supposed revelations that they have personally received. And, and on the basis of their own beliefs, their personal subjective ideas of what should be their dreams are promoting a gospel that's contrary to the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. And when Jude uses that term, the faith once and for all delivered to the saints, he's talking about the faith that was given uh, to the people of his day through the Old Testament. He was talking about the faith that had been revealed through the life, death, teachings, and resurrection of Jesus, and the faith that the apostles, those who had been authorized by Christ to, to teach in his name and to continue the revelation that he had given us, uh, he was talking about the faith that the apostles uh, were giving us. And if you put that together, the Old Testament, the revelation we have in Jesus, the revelation of the apostles, really you have the Bible, you have the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Gospels. Uh, so we are told to contend for this very same faith that Jude told uh, the the church members of his day. He, did, he wasn't writing to preachers. He wasn't writing to the elders. He writes to those who are called and kept in Christ. He's writing to members of that church that you are to know the truth. You are to stand for the truth, defend it, and, and point out where those who are uh, misrepresenting it are doing so. And that's why, again, every generation in its own way has had to contend for the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. And this is simply our turn. And many of you have been in this for many, many years. And, and you know names that uh, Tom and I and Helen Ray is um, on this call. She's been involved in this maybe longer than uh, any of us. Uh, there are people who for the past 50 years when things were really difficult, uh, when there really was a stigma to standing up for the Orthodox faith in the United Methodist Church. And when you criticize the denomination, you, you were uh, vilified in the worst possible way. Those folks saw that it was their turn to contend for the faith, and they were faithful to do so. 
and, and we're able to have hope for the future because they did. And now it's our turn to be those. And I really do believe that what we are going to create by God's grace is going to be a faithful witness and a great blessing to people in this country and all around the world for not just our time, not just for the next generation, but for generations and generations. What Wesley uh, began in the 1730s, here we are uh, in the early 2000s. Um, and, and what he did is still powerful. It's still changing lives. It's still exciting young people uh, about knowing God in a personal way and using the spiritual disciplines for real transformation. Uh, about uh, holiness and sanctification in our lives. And, and this is just a, a reinvigoration of that. And I genuinely believe that what we're doing will not just outlive us all, but it will be a blessing to the world for generations and generations to come. So that leads me back to once again saying thank you for staying with us. Thank you for trusting us. Thank you for giving us the resources we need to contend for the faith. Uh, that's our only desire. And uh, we're so grateful for you. So Ralph, are there any questions that- uh, sure. sure. We've got uh, one uh, comment and two questions so far. Uh, the comment is we should learn what vote means in French and Swahili. That would be so, very, very effective. I will. That, that uh, well, well noted and well taken. <laughs> uh, the first question is, uh, could uh, you speak to the pros and cons of a conference joining the Global Methodist Church? Well, I will, and then Tom um, may have thoughts different than I do. So it, it is funny. I have strong opinions on this because of uh, our particular context, but I think in many other uh, annual conferences, it's the same thing. There are some uh, traditionalists, leaders in um, the WCA. So just, this is a bit of an overstatement, but just to help you, Good News, with the help of some others, created the WCA. That was, uh, we knew that uh, there might come a day when we needed to have a new uh, landing place for faithful congregations. And it couldn't be the Good News Methodist Church, because Good News had been, had fought a lot of battles. Even our friends said, you guys have blood on your hands. You've been mischaracterized and you're not going to get a fair, fair hearing. So we created the WCA to be this positive uh, movement that would look at the future and begin to share a vision of what the future might be like. And Good News would continue to remain in the trenches and kind of fight the battles and be willing to uh, suffer the slings and arrows of our foes. And then as it's developed, uh, the WCA uh, saw its uh, mission to create a new denomination, uh, the Global Methodist Church. And uh, the reason that was is again, they said, well, some people said, well, you guys are pretty narrow. You're kind of some of the same people. And so that uh, group reached out to uh, traditionalists who hadn't been identified with any of the other renewal groups. We found out that we had so much in common. They kind of found out we're not the mean, hard-hearted, uh, belligerent, small-minded, judgmental hypocrites and Pharisees that we've been portrayed to be. And so they said, oh, well, y'all are kind of good-hearted like we are, and you love Jesus like we do, and you believe in the Bible like, yeah, we can work together. So that kind of brought forth the, um, the Global Methodist uh, Church. So some people who are leaders of WCA and even Global Methodist Church, they said, you know, I, I don't want to take my annual conference because that means there'll be a lot of churches that will go with us. So if, a, if an annual conference votes to go with the Global Methodist Church, all the churches would go into the Global Methodist Church. And if a church didn't want to go into the Global Methodist Church, it would have to vote to remain with the what we call the post-separation United Methodist Church. And they say, we don't want to take those uh, churches. Um, my thinking on why it's a positive, there are really two reasons. Um, one is that 
there will be a lot of churches that will just go with their annual conference. It'll be easier. They won't have the wherewithal to really figure it all out and they'll just go with their annual conference. And maybe that means there'll be some that aren't 100% with us, but in my own uh, annual conference, I think of how many little towns that if they, if those little churches don't go with us, there's not going to be a faithful Methodist witness in those little towns, maybe forever. Uh, as much as we might like to think, we're going to be starting this new denomination. We are going to have, I think, more resources than people think we will, but we're not going to have as great as we need. So we're not going to be starting a new Methodist church in Garrison, Texas. And I bet even those of you in the Woodlands don't know where Garrison, Texas is. There is a a Methodist church there. We're not going to be starting a new uh, Methodist uh, church in Naples or Sulphur Springs. That's, that's not going to happen anytime soon. If those churches go with us, it'll be much easier to send an evangelical pastor there than having to begin a whole new church in these tiny little towns. So that's one reason why. The other reason that I think it's very helpful if we can uh, take an entire uh, annual conference into the uh, Global Methodist Church is because the story for churches like mine, the Woodlands Methodist Church, is so much better. The story is, hey, our annual conference voted to go with the Global Methodist Church, and we just want to go with our bishop who's going to the Global Methodist Church. We just want to go with the uh, majority of uh, Methodist churches in this area. We just want to be who Methodists have always been. And Methodists have decided that to remain who we are, we have to go in this direction. And that way we don't have to take a vote. If our annual conference go, decides to go with the uh, post-separation United Methodist Church, we'll have to vote. And we can say it's about um, a lack of um, accountability. We can say there's bishops, et cetera, don't even believe in the authority of the Bible, but it's going to come down and people are going to say, it's really about gay people, isn't it? And we're going to say, not really, but that's how it's going to be presented. And if our church votes, though we are a traditional congregation, we know not everybody is going to share the traditional view. And that means you're going to have friends in your church voting against each other. You're going to have parents saying, you know, our daughter, she grew up with your daughter and she loves a woman and wants to be married in this church. And you don't want her to be. What makes your daughter different? And all of a sudden, these battles that we've had at general conference with people we see every four years, and it's like, yeah, here they come. You know, I'm going to try to be nice to them. I don't have to see them that often. Now, all of a sudden, it's people that are sitting in the pew next to each other talking about their families and being rejected. And it's for all kinds of reasons. I believe it's just much, much better if an annual conference is able to go with the Global Methodist Church and then make those churches that want to stay with the post-separation UMC, make them take the vote and have those kinds of um, issues to deal with. Tom, do you have other thoughts? I think you're right on target, uh, Rob. I think one of the important points is the fact that many churches are don't know what they believe because they've had pastors that haven't really taught them and they haven't heard the scriptures preached. And so um, by going with the annual conference into the new Global Methodist Church, they have the opportunity to receive an evangelical pastor who's really going to lead them in faithful uh, ways. And I think, you know, churches that are kind of muddled or middle of the road can really be turned around and, and brought to a very strong situation if they get the right pastoral leadership. Uh, and I think that it really varies depending on the annual conference and part of the country. Um, you know, a place like uh, Texas, that, that would be an ideal. Uh, in Wisconsin, where I'm from, we, we are used to being the marginalized few. And so for, for our, our local churches to vote to join the Global Methodist Church is not a big deal because we're used to going against the flow. Um, and so there are a lot of uh, very liberal you know, conferences that have no possibility of joining the Global Methodist Church. And, 
those local churches, I think, are in an environment where they understand the reality and are able to make that decision, and it wouldn't be as uh, wrenching as, as the way you described uh, for the Woodlands and how that would be. So I think depending on the situation, but I, I agree that where it's possible, an annual conference really could and should uh, join the Global Methodist Church. Great. Uh, we have one more question and one uh, comment. So the question is, could you speak to the tension for a pastor on being appointed by the bishop for the order of the, of the uh, local UMC and the pastor's role in the local church discerning its way out of the UMC? Well, I'm not certain I completely understand, um, but I'll take a shot at it. If this doesn't get close, just uh, type in a little bit more uh, info so we can figure it out. You know, the every bishop is different. We just recently had a um, centrist progressive bishop who said that she wanted all of her churches to know about the protocol. Um, it's not because she wants them to leave, but she is uh, fair and thinks this is going to happen possibly within a year and churches ought to be thinking about it. They ought to be able to make an informed uh, decision. Uh, so there's some bishops like that. And so they have given their pastors permission to talk to their congregations about it. Others um, are going to want to control the entire process. They'll want to uh, have um, conference meetings where the bishop and his or her team um, explains everything, um, whether that's truly fair or not. I don't know. Uh, it'll depend on that bishop and that team. Uh, but every, and I know this is easier to say here, though uh, this may sound like I'm uh, patting myself on the back. When I was a, a young pastor uh, in, a, in a little town called Atlanta, Texas, that's when I started getting um, in a more public way involved in these issues. And it wasn't a popular thing to do. And so some places there's more of a hit from your bishop than other places. But all of us have to come to a point where we say, I don't care what my bishop wants. I'm the pastor of this congregation, and it's up to me to make people aware of what's going on, what their choices are. And as their pastor, it's my responsibility to tell them what I think the scriptures teach and what I think a faithful way forward is. It's funny that only um, conservatives wrestle with this issue. Uh, you, you are not going to find that any, certainly not many, progressive and centrist pastors being concerned that their bishop's going to be upset if they talk about uh, these things. Uh, they feel like it's their duty, their right, their mission. And so it's only conservatives who are either trying to honor their bishop's authority or who are uh, somewhat afraid of the punitive um, repercussions. So there's going to come a time when all of us are going to just have to say, I've got a greater allegiance than to my bishop. I've got a greater accounting than what may be done to me in my career. There is my calling, there is my Lord, and I have to be faithful to that. If that doesn't get close to where the questioner wanted, please uh, send in something again and let me or let Tom or I have another crack at it. Uh, the next is just a comment uh, from uh, Warren. Uh, Rob, I remember attending a Good News board meeting in the early 80s, and there was not a person in that room that had not paid a price for standing with Good News. Yeah, yeah Warren, when I put my screen back on and saw you there, I should have said you and Helen Ray both have been involved in this uh, longer than uh, the rest of us have, certainly longer than uh, Tom and I have, and Norma's been part of this for a long while, too. Yeah, we, um, of course, I knew uh, some of these, you know, uh, and Tom did well, people who were y'all's friends and that y'all were uh, arm in arm with, they were 
uh, the uh, people that Tom and I looked up to and uh, I'm just sentimental by nature, but I used to feel so privileged to be around and to uh, be in the presence of people uh, like, you know, Bill Henson and uh, Ed Robb II and um, there are others, uh, uh, but some, a few still living but many gone and uh, it was it was pretty heady stuff for some young kid preacher to be around these people and to uh, see the uh, the way that they were treated when they were men and women of such integrity and such depth and um, deep christian conviction uh, to be treated the way that they were by their bishops to read things that were said about them um, and, and to marvel at with what class and dignity they were able to carry themselves. So uh, honestly, you know, Tom and I um, realize very much that we stand on their shoulders, on your shoulders, and uh, consider it a real privilege to be in this uh, position. And we hope to be um, as faithful or almost as faithful as those who were. And most of y'all may know that we just uh, this past week lost one of our, our great ones, Billy Abraham, um, who is a world-class theologian, philosopher, um, was had retired from Perkins School of Theology, where he was such a beacon of light for many traditional evangelical Methodists, was their port in the storm, and uh, their great um, friend and and mentor and had retired and was now leading something new that's very exciting here at Baylor University. They've begun what's called Wesley House that will uh, provide um, you know, a Master's of Divinity degree for students who want to be ordained in the, uh, the Wesleyan tradition and, and will end up many of them going to the Global Methodist Church. And we were just devastated to hear that he had died suddenly just a few days ago, but that's another one of our truly great ones um, and um, who's gone that we had hoped to step into the future with. Well, we are just about out of time, but let me uh, end with uh, one, I think it's one question here. It, David says, it sounds like a conference will have a shortage of pastors no matter which way it votes, as pastors are more portable than local churches are. And I think the question is, it, is it easier for the progressive pastors or traditional pastors to depart the conference? I'll say two seconds, then Tom, you finish up. And Tom, why don't you pray for us at the end of this? And um, yeah, you know, it's going to be it's going to be really interesting. And I think in a conference like mine, many of the uh, progressive pastors are realizing uh, they realize they haven't been able to be open and honest about what they believe um, because it would be disruptive to their congregations. Um, many congregations, as you know, have no clue about where pastors really are in terms of what they believe. Um, and they they are realizing they just may not have a place to land. And uh, I, th I don't think that's going to be the issue with conservative uh, pastors nearly as much. There may be some issues in a particular annual conference, but we're going to have many traditional uh, churches who either have a traditional pastor and they will continue or they are going to be looking for a pastor because the pastor will have to acknowledge that he or she wants to be in the post-separation UMC. And one last thing, and Tom, you can mention this quickly, the, the local congregations in the GMC will have the ability to say to the pastor, thanks so much, but your time is over with us. And if it becomes clear that a pastor doesn't share that congregation's traditional beliefs, and they will have had to sign something saying that they do before they enter the Global Methodist Church, they're able to take care of that. And so rather than people pretending that they're one thing and being something else in this new setup, 
uh, it'll be more, e it'll be easier to discover that. And then there won't be any bishops saying, well, no, this is your pastor and you need to stay together and we can find a way to work it out. The congregation will just say, we, we want to be led by men and women who, um, who believe in the scriptures as God's word and who understand that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. That's, that's who we are and that's what we need. So um, I think that it'll be real interesting, but primarily for progressives and centrists, because they're going to discover that uh, our denomination, our laity is much more conservative than they are. Tom, do you have other thoughts? Oh, Rob, I think you're right. The, uh, the, the progressives and centrists are going to have an oversupply and uh, we are going to have an undersupply. Um, talking about portability, um, the, um, the, the new Global Methodist Church envisions an easier route for pastors to go from one annual conference to another. So uh, they can be appointed across different annual conferences. Plus, our annual conferences may end up being larger in territory uh, just because there may be fewer churches in a given geographical area. I mean, for example, in Wisconsin, we might have 50 churches that are evangelical. So we will have to join with other areas near us in order to form an annual conference. Um, so there will be opportunities and, and the, the whole process of ordination makes it easier for people to go into ministry. Uh, so we're hoping that that's going to really draw people uh, and make it easier for them to step in. But, um, and I also should mention that in the protocol, there is the provision for what we're calling transitional appointments. So let's say you have a, a centrist pastor serving an evangelical church. Uh, the church wants to go with the Global Methodist Church. The pastor wants to go with, stay with the United Methodist Church. But they could continue to serve that evangelical church with the permission of the congregation and the bishop as long as they're willing to uphold the standards of the Global Methodist Church while they do that, while they wait for an appointment to open up in the United Methodist Church for them. So that's an option as well to cover some of these bases. But it, it is going to be an interesting time. and. Uh, you know, that's the uh, definition of, uh, of uh, how we move forward, you know, that, that saying it, it's good to live in an interesting time because there's challenges and there's all kinds of opportunities and um, we're just waiting to see what God is going to do and we're looking forward to that. So I want to add my words of thanks to you for all of your faithful support through the years and and continuing that, and we, we certainly don't take it for granted. We appreciate very much uh, the sacrificial giving of our donors and um, the way that you make possible the work that we do. And I hope that you know this time together has given you kind of a, a taste of the work that's going on and, and what it is that we're about and what, what's happening in the church. Uh, feel free to reach out to us anytime uh, with uh, questions, concerns, comments, whatever. We welcome uh, that interaction with you. So with that, uh, let's uh, close with a word of prayer, shall we? Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the Lord of the universe and that you have reached down into this world, this world that's broken with sin, pain, and all kinds of other adverse things that are going on in this world. And you've reached down by your Holy Spirit by coming here as a man to live, to die, and to rise again, to show us the way, and most importantly, to lead us in that way. And thank you for entrusting us with that message of good news. Thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to serve you in this way. And we just pray, Lord, that you would bless each and every person on this call, that you would help us to continue to be faithful wherever you have planted us, in whatever aspect of work in ministry that you've given us to do, that we would be faithful servants of yours. And we pray for the work and ministry of Good News and our partners, the WCA, um, Confessing Movement, but most especially for the Global Methodist Church as it begin, begins to be formed soon. We pray, Lord, that it would happen, that general conference will be held, that the separation could take place, and that the new church could begin. According to your will and your purpose for us, Lord, we pray that you would bring this about so that there might be a strong and faithful Wesleyan witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
for it's in his name that we pray all these things. Amen. Thank you guys. Really appreciate it.